and now it's not not oh, oh! <laughs> maybe start again that was loud <laughs> okay you ready all right hello i'm dr chris and I'm Alan Chatney. And this is uh, Source Points Podcast number three, where we talk about uh, geoscience, oil, gas, politics, movies, and generally anything that may pop up. Today we've got John Hogue as a guest uh, of, of the podcast. Hello. Yeah, very exciting. Welcome, John. First guest. First guest, inaugural guest here on uh, Source Points. And, and uh, we'll see. We'll see what that does to our, to our listening uh, public <laughs> here. So that's good stuff. Um, so why don't we start with a bit of an introduction, uh, John, just your career and kind of, you know, where, where did you start and how, how, how did you end up, uh, you know, where you are today? Sure. I, um, so my name is John Hogue. I um, am a geologist by training. I graduated from McMaster University in way back in uh, the Paleozoic in 1981. <laughs> um, uh, from there, I have done about 36 years now of high-risk exploration uh, through various companies, have worked most of the frontier basins in Canada, the very high Arctic. I started in 1981 with Gulf Canada, went to work on the East Coast, both in offshore Nova Scotia, offshore Newfoundland, from about 1984 to, uh, geez, to about 2014. And in that in that time period as well, um, continued to work on Arctic, Arctic uh, issues, uh, the last part of my career, when I was still working and not a consultant, I was work, working with MGM Energy Corp in the Arctic, Mackenzie Valley, and the, m the central Mackenzie Valley and the uh, Mackenzie Delta. That was an eight-year adventure that was a ton of fun and uh, really enjoyed it. And um, all through that time in my career, I also have been a, a very uh, a stalwart volunteer for uh, a ending with being both the president of the Canadian Society of Petroleum Geologists, the CSPG, in 2004, and the president of AAPG, the American Association of Petroleum Geologists, uh, back uh, just uh, two years ago from 2015 to 2016. Yeah, cool. And I think we first, when we first, I was trying to think of when did we first meet, I think you were, you had, you were at Burlington for a time, and then ConocoPhillips bought Burlington out. And then I think I think you just stepped into the f back into the frontier, uh, if I remember right, at Conoco Phillips in that new in that new role. And and I think that's the first time we ever met. And you were still in the old Burlington building. You didn't move over to the Conoco building. Yeah, and 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 the funny the funny part about that that Al was um, I started you know I I ended my uh, frontier career at uh, in Canada, which nobody would consider a frontier company because right. it's an unconventional company. Uh, so I so I was doing high risk exploration at Pan Canadian. We merged the great merger of equals. We merged into in Canada. Um, in Canada, didn't really want to do frontier exploration, so we were shutting down all of that. I uh, decided that I would jump into the unconventional game. I moved to Burlington, and uh, 86 days after moving to Burlington, Conoco Phillips bought us. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so I and I really wasn't that enamored to go back to a super major. I'd started at Gulf, which was a super major, and went back to a super major. Well, and ironically, Gulf became Conoco Phillips ultimately. So you came full circle and in the that. Funniest part about it was when I moved into the Conoco Phillips building, which is the Ninth Avenue building. That was the old Gulf building. I started my career on the 16th floor of the old Gulf building. I moved back to the same floor, the 16th floor, <laughs> in Conoco Phillips. <laughs> <laughs> which I had never ever wanted to do, but I mean, I had a good 16 months there before I went to MGM. I ran the uh, the high Arctic work, their Fulford uh, work. I did their East Coast, and I did unconventionals in Western Canada, and it was a really fun time. But um, but I I was tired of being at Supermajors. Yeah. So on the volunteering side, the um, y you were recently the uh, president of the APG, I know, and you you mentioned you were the president of both. Was that at the same time or no? So so both. Uh, I fundamentally believe one of my tenements of, of working is to give back and, and and so all through my career right after uh, graduating and starting at Gulf I started volunteering with the CSPG you know doing little things um, and in getting involved and in both organizations increased my level of involvement to the point of running for president and being elected in both. CSPG was back in 2004 
Okay. So, um, so that was, in, and those were less difficult times. Money was easy for the associations, the learned societies, and uh, that was easy. With the APG, which was just the uh, 2015 16. Yeah, it was tough, right? It, it was a tough was Very, uh, very difficult time for all learned societies, whether it's engineering, geoscience. Um, because of the downturn, there's been a number of challenges that they have. They, first of all, people aren't being sent to as many conferences. Uh, exhibitors mm. aren't displaying mm. in as large booths mm. if they're displaying at all, and sponsorship for conferences is way down. So it's been it's been a tough run, right? I know that all all industry associations, even even the contracting associations, are having difficulty right, right now. So. And so, so my year was an unfortunate year where I not only had to to pull back the capital burn of the organization. It also meant losing about thirty percent of the staff. Yeah, which is and, never and, fun. And it's it was not fun. Uh, today, the association is, I think, in better shape because we have um, brought the staffing levels down to an appropriate mix. But all all associations are still challenged with the fact that they can't they can't give the members what the members had in the past for the same amount of dues, and nobody wants to increase the dues to potentially lose their membership. That's a, it's a real challenge. I know that the uh, Canadian Society of Exploration Geophysicists, CSEG, the, the geophysical equivalent of, of those associate of the Canadian, of the Petroleum Geologists, um, CSPG Association, um, you know, they just stopped printing the magazine. Right. I mean, they, they had to go online. They couldn't, <clears throat> they couldn't print it. I mean, so these are, these are big problems. The other thing that I've noticed is one of the, one of the most rewarding uh, pieces about uh, about many of these conferences, these associations, or what they do with students, right. N- new grads, you know, fresh outs, wh- whatever we want to call, it, you know, connecting new geoscience, geology students with uh, with industry. Frankly, at these different events and different, uh, diff- what what's your take on that? I mean, is that something that's that's still happening? Or and and that's the challenge, not only in North, let's use North America in the world, because North America sits in, it's almost an island of geoscientists in the world, sits as a separate island. But uh, as president of AAPG, um, you know, AAPG is an association of 38,000 members in 122 countries. So my year as president, I traveled the world, um, you know, not only going to conferences and and, uh, being engaged with the membership, but also spending whatever time I had going and meeting with students right and student student geoscience students around the world ask are asking questions well what am i going to do with this degree yeah absolutely i get that on my social media account all the time because i you know well it's a big part of your engagement chris yeah and they ask me i don't i don't even know what to say uh, other than uh, say two years ago when they asked me it was uh uh I didn't. I couldn't respond. Now I would actually say I think the prospects are getting better. I, I think we all might agree on on that. Yeah, I think the prospects are getting better. the The challenge, though, for them is for the group that is just finished or just finishing, the jobs still aren't coming back. There's right. a, no, a small mm-hmm. number of jobs, but not enough jobs to sustain those people. And so, what I say to students is, listen, there. Although we, what we hear is, you know, oil by 2030 will be over. You know, everybody's going to drive an electric oh, car. Oh, yeah, which fly, is complete. That's fly, nonsense. Fly, fly in electric yeah. planes and, yeah. and have electric Rainbow dust and, cars. <laughs> and I say, even though uh, there, is a, there is an entire career, there's a generational career here for you. Now, the difference today is when I graduated in 1981, we were explorers. Mm. We were told to go out. And well, you went to the Arctic Islands, for example. Right. I mean, that's it, true. It, and by the way, that's still sitting there. It's that's still sitting there. All those, re- well, all those northern resources are still sitting there. But, but we were explorers, and what we did was we went and found oil and gas. Today, what we do is we're exploiters. We exploit oil and gas resources that we know are in the ground in, as, as unconventional resources. It's a very different role for geoscientists than it was 30, 20 years ago. <laughs> And so what I say to them is, listen, if you're finishing your undergrad and you can't find a job, go back to school and don't do a geology master's. Go back and get an engineering degree. Mm. If you're mm. good with math yep. and science, go back and get a master's in reservoir engineering. Or, or Chris t- went and did GIS. He did GIS, GMS, right. G- right. GIS you know. Um, or Compl- complementary skills. Exactly. Yeah. Or take a job in the environmental side, which involves subsurface. Because as long if you're working with groundwater, you're still working with reservoir systems. You're working with a porous unit, and the water's moving from the potentiometric high to low, 
it, we're, we're still doing all of that same work that we would do as subsurface people and come back into the, the organi- to, into oil and gas when the jobs are available. Well, yeah. this would and also a, be a, compl- a ship. Yeah, sorry, go ahead, but uh, complimentary uh, skill sets, basically. Go ahead. Uh, I, I was going to say that's also something that would have to be affected at the uh, institution level, going to universities and say, hey, uh, and I assume that's being done at, at, on uh, – that end. So, so here's here's my take. Depending on the university, mm-hmm. it's being done. So, so if you look at U of C, University of Calgary, if you look at Mount Royal University, you know there's the ability for somebody to take additional courses outside of their disciplines. But I say to them, make sure that if you're doing a geology degree, and you can take a couple engineering courses in flow mechanics, do take, it. Yeah. Take them. Yeah. Don't absolutely. take. Don't take. You know, basket weaving somewhere just for a simple course. Take something that's going to help you with, with your education. And here's the challenge we have in universities in Canada. Universities in Canada teach pure science. Uh, universities in the U.S. Many of them teach applied science. Mm. So you know, if you go to you know, if you go to the if you go to Colorado School of Mines, you learn how to read well logs. You learn how to do reserves. You learn mm-hmm. how to interpret geological data. And we don't learn that in Canada. No, that- because, because our, our universities believe that, the, and, and again, I'm not saying it's wrong, but what we do is we teach kids how to lear- understand geology, ge- the geoscience. The theory. But theory. not yeah. the applied. Hmm. And so you're competing against schools that are very different than the schools that we have U of C and U- University of Calgary and University of Alberta, a little bit different, but the rest of Canada, pure science. Hmm. That's, uh, that's, that's a challenge. Boy, I, I hadn't thought that through. And the other thing that, that, you know, that I've been, we've been trying to do here at, at our little company is we've been trying to hire geoscience grads into non, they're not necessarily technical positions, but just to get that ground-level work experience piece right. taken care of. We've ended up hiring, what, eight or nine, something yeah. like that. and. Yeah. And, 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 but it takes a certain amount of dedication and sort of, you know, sort of buckling down and just saying, okay, I'm going to go to the field or I'm going to do something that's, that, that's part of the industry, but it's not really geoscience yes. right in the beginning. Yeah. And, and that's another, that's exactly another thing I say to them is I say, listen, is your, is your science your passion? Because if your science, your passion and you can't find a job, not everybody graduates with a letter from ExxonMobil to say, hi, welcome to the company. Right. And, and in fact, the majority of people don't fall that way. There's a, there's a circuitous route that they come into the, into the oil and gas world. Some of them come through well sites. Some of them come through environmental. Some of them come through going back, getting master's degree, which is applied mm-hmm. and pop in. Not everybody comes just because they're excellent at what they do. So I say, so take a job as a technologist, Right. Yes, you're not working as a geologist, yes, or a geoscientist. Yes, you're not. It's not going to apply to, to a PEGA, our Association of Professional Engineers and Geoscientists, as work, but it gets you in the door. Yeah. And, and from there, if you're good, people are going to keep you. So many of them think that they need to get that, that gold standard of a super major job on their desk to, you know, or a, a bum in a seat in a super major to be successful. You don't need that to be successful. And they're not, they're not aware of that because their professors don't necessarily tell them that. Yeah, the connection to the working world is very different. I remember when we had one of our, one of our uh, a, a new geo, geophysics grads start with us, <clears throat> we put him in, in a position of, of a data manager, okay, so a few right. years ago. And, uh, you know, so working with data, with, with geophysical data. And he'd never, it, it's to your point of applied science, he'd never sort of seen header information right. and, you know, file formats and these different things. He, he said to me after a few months, he goes, I feel like my degree did nothing to prepare me for the working world. Right. When I said, I said, give yourself some credit. It did. You've got the theory. You can do the math. You've got, you understand the, the, the science behind it. And now it's sort of, okay, let's connect the dots between, you know, how it happens at, at, at the ground floor to, right. to the esoteric sort of, well, you know, wave equations that, 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 that goes to the, uh, the, the theory behind a re- uh, university and what it's actually meant to do. It's a finishing school traditionally. So, uh, you know, having been on both sides of the, uh, of the academic aisle, that being I've got a Ph.D. Yeah. And I've gone to a technical college, that being Southern Alberta Institute of Technology. Right. There is massive use in being trained what to do. 
right. rather than the, the underlying how. And that's exactly what I got at a college level was this is what you need to do. Here you're going to do it. You do it over and over again until it's right. Whereas at a university level, I found, and I loved university, <laughs> and that's why I stayed in for so long. <laughs> but it was a lot of uh, stuff that I haven't touched in years. Right. Like, yeah. literally, like, there's math courses that I took that, you know, I, I couldn't do them now. Maybe I could look in a book, but it's like, how, how do you tell, like, what do you, do, what do you say to a potential graduate? You know, all those courses you use, you'll never, you, you're probably not going to use again. Well, well I, think, I think the difference, and again, I support the way we do our science in university as pure science. I support that because mm-hmm. what it does, it, it, it trains your brain to work a certain way. And when something new comes up, you're not afraid to do it because you hadn't tested it before, mm-hmm. right? And I go back to even when I was in university in the 70s, you know, we would complain to, you know, the department head, Jerry Middleton, and say, yeah, you know, these guys at University of Calgary, they get to do well log stuff. We don't get to do that. And he goes, that's not my job. My job is to train you to be a scientist. The companies will train you to be a mm. petroleum geologist. The, now, let's move forward 35 years. The companies don't train you to be a petroleum geologist. Mm. Yeah, That's that. the big difference. Right, right. So what we're lacking is we don't have that middle, and the learned societies can't provide that the same way Gulf or Shell or Chevron could in the, in the early 80s. We don't have that anymore for... The vast majority of geoscientists. So if you go back to my generation of geoscientists, every one of us would have been trained intensively when we got here. A year and a half, two years of working on projects, doing uh, courses. With a mentor usually? Yeah, with, yeah. With, well, with mentors and, and with specialists coming up, you know, for, with golf, specialists coming up from Houston to teach courses for 10 days. That was all part of your training program. That doesn't exist anymore. If, you, if you're a new grad walking into Encana, you're a bum in a seat and you got a job to do and you focus on that job and you get really good at it and nobody moves you because you get really good at it. Mm. And, there's and the, oftentimes that's a software driven thing too, right? right? Sometimes. Right. And, yep. and so you don't get to look at core, you don't get to go out to outcrops, you don't do, you don't do the same types of things. So you're, you're stuck in learning a very, very um, detailed job without having expansive knowledge of anything else. And there's where we're going to suffer I would say decades from now, because the geoscientists we're bringing in today aren't being trained in all aspects of geoscience. You know, I'm a, I'm a high-risk frontier explorer. I didn't like development, but I had to do development. So I understand how to do development, but I really don't like it. Mm. But these guys will never get to explore. But, you know, it's, it's kind of ironic, because here we live in an age where, you know, the um, – We've got more access to more information at our fingertips, at our desktops than ever before. And yet what you're sort of saying and describing is that the presentation of that, the structuring of that, the organizing of all that information through mentorship and through structured training in a way that is going to create kind of long-term experience and value may not be there. That's, that's a real challenge for right. industry. And, right? and, and that's what I say to the st- one of the things I say to the students. I say, listen, it's your career. It's not the company's career. You need to you need to ensure that you're getting what you want for what you want to do. What's your you know one of the, I ask students when I go and speak to them I say what's your five year plan? Yeah, you're in the headlights. <laughs> yeah. Well, they they pa- are partying. Uh, no, well, 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 no, they're graduating. So what's your five year oh. plan? Uh, I want a job. That's not yeah. a five year plan. Yeah, that's, that's a goal. Yeah, what would you like to be? So I say, I say to them, I say, so shut your eyes. Tell me what you'd like to be doing in five years. Well, you know, one guy says, I want to be president <laughs> of a company. G- 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 well, that's great. Start. Build, yeah. build a plan on how you're going to get there. What yeah. do you need to get there? So if you want to be an explorationist, well, you don't want to work in the Western Canada sedimentary basin. Mm. You, you're going to want to work in... North. Uh, Northern in, Canada. Uh, well, Northern Canada... Or, or Norway, or you're going right. to work at Saudi Aramco, or you're going to work somewhere in the world. Sub, even, Sub-Saharan offshore, Africa, off, some offshore, offshore, East Coast. Gabon, wherever. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to decide what you want to do. And how can you decide what you want to do when you've never done anything? Yeah, exactly. And how do you get a job over there if, if you don't have right. the experience? So let's, let's talk about, you know, exploration. And, and, and since we're sitting here in, in, uh, in Canada, you know, look at, let's look at northern Canada and sort of say, what is going on? I mean, it, mm. there was a time. I mean, you you started your career. You say at Golf eighty one Arctic Islands, way in the north. Well, and, and what were those? What were those? 
discoveries like you know i mean i i remember there were some epic discoveries out there like just so phenomenal when I, so when i started working in so i gra- so i graduated in 1981 spring of 81 uh may 15th i started working at golf the year before um you know, it's funny because students say, well, how did you get your job? And I say, well, it's a little different. Uh, you know, I came out at a time where geologists were in strong demand. I had offers from five companies. Um, you know, my I got bullish enough to say, I'm only going to go to the company that will let me work in the frontiers. Mm. Nice. Pretty, a, pretty. You wouldn't do that today. <laughs> no. <laughs> no uh, right? I'm all, oh, you're, uh, not, you're not working in the Arctic and, Islands. And, Sorry. And I'm so, not going to join you. Know, uh, so, so Dome said, oh, no, no, you can't work in the Arctic until you have three years' experience. And, and Gulf said, sure, you can start in the frontiers. So I went to Gulf. And did you get um, up to the islands? Did oh, you, yeah. Did I went, you? Up, went up twice. Um, so, so here's how it used to work in the, in the high Arctic. So we're talking Queen Elizabeth Islands north of uh, 78 degrees. Uh, permanent ice, still permanent ice, uh, although um, people may dispute that. It's still permanent ice. It's sp- in, in other words, permanent ice today. It's today. Yeah. Still so for, ice yeah, today. So, so Sverdup Basin, um, significant amount of oil and gas uh, discoveries onshore. And then in the late 1970s, they developed technology to be able to drill offshore. So they would, they would fly in. They would flood the ice to 10 meters thick. Holy cow! Right, then they would build. A, they would build a, a, an airstrip. So this is sea ice, sea and then ice. you're flooding it with fresh water no, or with salt water. With salt water. Okay. Salt water, and it's still cold enough that well, it's, it's, yeah. it's minus. It's forty minus below. 30, so the sea water, all the yeah, time. even the with sea, all the salt, it's the, still the freezing. The sea ice, yeah. the sea ice freezes. They'd they'd make a runway. They'd fly the rigs on Herc's Hercules transports. They'd mm-hmm. land them on the Arctic ice. They'd build. They'd cut a hole in the ice, a moon pool in the ice. They'd, put, they'd build up the rig on the ice. Now, because the ice still has motion, there had to be a motion compensator like offshore, right? So right. Well, it's, it's, a, offshore, mm, it's, it's, it's technically offshore, an yeah. offshore rig, except it's mm. modified yeah. conventional rig, and they would drill underneath the Arctic Ocean. Uh, and, and so we would, we would fly up on, on old Pacific Western, for those of you old enough to remember PW. I remember. 727 I remember. Pacific Westerns. We leave Edmonton and fly straight to the well site and literally land on the Arctic Ocean. Uh, in a jet, in a on, jet the on the Arctic Ocean. That's amazing. I take it they don't do that any, anymore. No. Well, no. I'm, the Russians <laughs> might still be doing it, I think. Well, and, so, and then you would drill the wells, you would test the wells, and then you would get a significant discovery. Pan Arctic ran the fleet um, and all the other companies, what was called in those days the Arctic Islands Exploration Group. So it was, I might miss a company here, Gulf, Suncor, Imperial, um, Dome, uh, so a number of by um, Suncor you mean Petro Canada? No, right? uh, no, actually it was Suncor at that time. Really, Petro Canada, Petro Canada was involved in some of it, but not all of it. But uh, and I guess Petro Canada was early day, and it was the correct. federal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay. so this is how they used to drill these right up until the end of the National Energy Program in 1986, of course, and then at the end of the National Energy Program, it, the whole program died. Pan, Pan Arctic basically failed uh, to exist. All the assets went to Petro Canada because. They were the national oil company. And, uh, but, but they did produce out of a field called Bent Horn, which was a small oil field. On and I, I'm familiar with that one, Cameron, Cameron Island. Island. Right. A few years ago, we had some folks come and, and uh, paying us about shooting a 3D yeah. in Cameron Island, if you can imagine. Yeah, that and, and, what an amazing place. It, and, it, and it truly is, you know, you would drill in the winter so it would be permanently dark. Um, it was, it was an, I, always, I always thought, even back then, this is so unique. To be able mm, to be involved mm. as a young person, a young geoscientist, one, two years out of school, here I am sitting in, on the Arctic Ocean in the middle of the Sverda Basin on a well. And the, the last year I was there in 1984, one of the wells that we drilled was, it was called Buckingham, 068, was one of my, my opportunities that I presented, got it drilled. Unfortunately, we had um, messed up on the unconformities and uh, my, my, ser- my section was missing, <laughs> but we found oil and gas below that, but, di- but ran out of time to test it because you had to get off the ice before it melted. Right, you, it's, the clock is ticking. Right. So, See, uh, so it, was an ama- it was an amazing time, but even during that time into the ni- late 1980s, you had exploration in what well, that part would have been now today, Nunavut. Mm-hmm. You had exploration in the Beaufort Sea. You had exploration on the Mackenzie Delta. You had mm-hmm. exploration mm-hmm. in the Central Mackenzie Corridor. You had exploration all through the north, 
and today there's not a single well drilling. I know. It's tragic. You see, my time in the in the North starts a few years later, 1988, uh, 89, Mackenzie Delta, uh, you know, just the very tail end of that and right. some phenomenal discoveries in the in the Delta, the UNIPCAT discovery, yeah. uh, massive gas discovery, and then, of course, you know, rolling the tape forward to the whole McKenzie gas project, which just, just officially died a death right. here in the last, I've talked about that the last couple of podcasts. Um, you know, the, 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 the tough thing about that is that you make all these friends in the North and you know that this lack of activity in the North is really negatively impacting communities and businesses and, and some of our mutual friends in the North. Right. And, and I think that I think the challenge that we see in exploration in the North today is is twofold. Number one, the regulatory system has continued to grow to the point where even drilling a simple vertical well onshore takes about 18 months to get through the system. Just the regulatory oh, mm. system alone. If you make a discovery and you want to move it forward, the process is three to four years. And millions and, of dollars. And millions of dollars to not even know if you're going to be able to to produce that discovery. And number three, there's no takeaway capacity because everybody proposes that every pipeline goes south. Mm -hmm. So nobody nobody wants to provide a northern solution where all of this asset that's in the north moves out through the north. You know, the Russians are doing it today. The Russians are doing both LNG and oil transport out of the Kara Sea today, but we can't seem to, as a as a country, decide that it's okay to transport well, hydrocarbons out of the north. Let's think about let's think about all the other I mean we talk about that it's really good to compare this a little bit. You mentioned the Russians. Our neighbors immediately to the to the west uh, up in the Arctic, the Americans have been producing out of the Arctic for many many years. Correct. Uh, with with the with the giant Prudhoe Bay field under the current administration they're about to open up the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Right. It looks like. Right. Um, you know, you look at the in, in Norway the Norwegians. Uh, there was just a, a, an intervention by one of the NGOs, I think Greenpeace, taking them to court. They lost, yep. and the and the Norwegian government is is going to continue working. The Nor- Norwegian exploration is going to continue uh, in the Arctic, you know, right. in Norway. And here, you know, we think of Canada as an Arctic nation, and yet we're really dormant in the north. We're really not uh, mm. Uh, mm. Um, advancing you know, economic development and, and northern exploration in oil and gas in the north. Everybody else in the world that is an Arctic nation is. Mm-hmm. Right. And I think we're we're missing the boat on this one. I, I fully agree. You know, and it's not it's not only the, you know, Nor- Norway to me is a little bit of a different example because even though you're in the, the northern Barents Sea now where they're exploring the western Barents into the, to the Russian Barents, it's ice-free. So it is a little different, but it's, it's still a, an Arctic nation working in Arctic conditions, which means for three months of the year, it's virtually dark. Um, they don't have significant storms, but they still have storms. So we, we can go to our side of the, the, uh, of the Arctic. We've got all the right conditions through the winter time to be able to drill, discover, produce, and we can't seem to find a way in this country to move either our oil, our export our oil, which has been discovered to date, or export the, the trillions and trillions of cubic feet of gas that are sitting there onshore waiting to be exported somewhere. And instead, we're relying on continuously drilling in BC this, these assets, these unconventional assets, and still don't have a way to get them offshore. It's, right. it's, it, to me, it's, it's a problem of all governments, not one government, but all governments failing to see the, the bounty that is here for them to be able to supply clean energy to the world, which is what the other countries are doing. Um, they just seem to miss the mark. Mm. And, and the thing is, we've got a robust regulatory, it's too robust, arguably, uh, regulatory system in the north, or it's, if it's, it's perhaps not too robust, it's, it's, it's cautiously con- robust. Well, it's configured incorrectly <clears throat> that, that the, the, tr- it's on a hair trigger for massive assessments at, at too early a stage. That, it's, it's almost a, it's a poison pill sort of regulatory system when it, when you, if you look at the McKenzie. Yeah, my, my problem with the regulatory system in all three territories is this, that the territories 
control. Well, let's let's stick with the Northwest Territories and Yukon because Nunavut has a bit of a nuance. But the territorial government controls the lands, so they control the the ability to call for bids, be able to have companies come in and do work. The federal government controls the regulatory system related to environmental assessments, and there's the big challenge. Is because you've got the federal government controlling one asset or, or one one of the um, the main lines to get to development, and the territorial government controlling the the subsurface, you ne- they're never aligned. Mm. And what you need is a one shop stop. You know, like like we have on the east coast. If I use federal lands on the east coast, you have the boards, the regulatory boards. Canada, uh, Newfoundland, Labrador Offshore Petroleum Board controls all. They right. control every aspect because it's a federal, ter- provincial. Same with Canada, and Nova Scotia Offshore Petroleum Board controls it all. What we need in the north is we need one one body that will control all regulatory so that it's a one-stop shop. Industry walks in and says, I want to do this exploration. I found this. I want to develop it. And you're not working with different jurisdictions that have different timelines. Yeah. Well, and, and the other issue is that, is, and this is something that I think, you know, we talk about right now in the United States, they're going through this whole sort of foreign influence and foreign meddling. One of the challenges the challenges with our environmental assessment, you know, the Canadian Environmental Assessment Act, SIA as it's known, is that at least in the in the Northwest Territories, you know, if somebody, you know, the trigger for for an environmental assessment isn't some sort of well defined, you know, benchmark. Right. It's it's that there may be cause for public concern. Right. Right. A very arbitrary, a very a very a, a key vulnerability. So, if we had, for example, uh, a neighbor, an Arctic neighbor, that was interested in preserving their economic advantage, they would simply have to intervene and push this to environmental assessment. And I think that's happened on occasion. Right. You know, when you look at the Mackenzie Gas Project and the Joint Review Panel, you know, there were hundreds of interveners, many of them not even Canadian, right. uh, that were intervening in our internal affairs. Right. Uh, fundamentally, that continues to happen in the north, and 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 then meanwhile, you know, many of the many of the folks in the north sort of will console themselves um, by saying, well, you know, it's remote, it's expensive, the price of oil is down, you know, these kinds of excuses, they're not valid. Uh, I, I things totally are agree. things are happening in the in the uh, in Alaska. Things are happening in Norway. Things are happening in Russia through this entire downturn. It hasn't stopped. And mm. and in the oil and gas industry, the point I make over and over again in the north when I'm visiting is the oil and gas industry is not afraid of remote, challenging environments. I mean, you mentioned offshore yeah. eastern Canada. That's a that's a challenging environment. So. Well well yeah, and, and I and I would just say the the you hear this from all politicians in Canada. You hear that, well, the reason that there is no exploration is because of the price of oil. And and it's simply not true. Every everybody understands that frontier development takes time from from export let's remember even even fields like hibernia on the east coast of canada discovered in 19 uh 1979 or 1980 wasn't put on until uh tw- almost 20 years later you know so we understand there's a timeline so that the price of oil today means nothing to high risk exploration because it's the price of oil 20 years later when it's going to be delivered mm. that it makes a difference. The key is knowing that you can actually get it to production. Right. That's the key. Right. And yeah. so let's let's just take a perfect example of, of what happened just last year. Just last year we had the, the Beaufort Sea where there were billion-dollar bids, seismic acquired, and now a moratorium slapped on future development. Arbitrarily, by yeah. the way. And, with and, with and, no and consultation. Right, at right, just as the Inuvik Tuck Highway opens right. to to help facilitate the de- the delivery of services uh, through Tuck Toyuk Tuck right. through on land, land on land, right, right, C to C to C. This is the narrative. Right, right. just as that opens up, now we're going to kill offshore exploration right. in the north for no reason. Yeah, and 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 the federal government said, oh no no no, but it won't affect the current exploration licenses. Well, of course it affects the current exploration licenses. Nobody wants to go in and find something and then say. Ooh, this asset actually extends a little bit off. Oh, that's under moratorium. Mm. So as soon as you put a moratorium on, 
people say this government doesn't want oil and gas, and p- companies like Chevron and BP and ExxonMobil are all going to walk away from what appeared to be some really, really exciting high-risk oil opportunity offshore in the Beaufort Sea that has never been drilled before. And, and, and you know, the, the, the real shame is that we have in the North many existing discoveries. Right. Right. You've got, yep. I mean, let's just name a few that I'm familiar with in the Delta. You know, I mentioned Unipcat earlier. Yep. You've got Parsons Lake. Yep. You've got, you know, a number of discoveries. Well, over six TCF onshore of gas alone. And in the offshore, you know, almost a billion barrels of oil if you accumulate it all with the center being Amalagak. Amalagak is the great, yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. So, so again, this oil that we know is there, you know, when I was at ConocoPhillips, we were we were actively looking at how you would produce that asset to tankers and move it out. But of course, with the federal government saying, "Well, we're putting a moratorium on this," why would anybody open those books and start to look at this asset again? And the other challenge is with the federal system: once you get a significant discovery declaration into a significant discovery license, there's no clock. Mm. So uh, you keep them forever. Well, if I'm a super major who wants to be here for 100 years, my oil and gas has no time limit on it. There's no cost to hold. Why do I really care? So it would take a political sea change for this to change right. at all. Yeah. As, and especially in the offshore. On the on, mm. In the onshore, I think it would be, it would just take, in some ways, I'm happy that the Mackenzie Gas Project died. Because as long as Exxon held the certificate, no one else would think about it. Now that Exxon doesn't hold a certificate to build a pipeline, maybe, well, maybe. They, yeah, do they, do they hold it? How does that work now well, that they've disbanded? Do that, they still that, have they, the no, permit? They, they'll lose the permit. Right, so the, okay. So what will happen now is maybe others will find another innovative way to bring that gas out. Maybe it goes, maybe it doesn't come to Alberta. Maybe it goes to, maybe it goes to the, through the U.S. as long as we've got a president who's willing to sign an export permit. Maybe we ship LNG out of Valdez, mm, right? Yeah. Like there's opportunity now for somebody to reimagine a project in the Mackenzie Delta. That's the part that makes me happy. Although for the people of the North, it's not happy times. No, it's not. It's I know from talking to my friends up there, it's very, very, very tough. Uh, very, very tough in mm. economic uh, environment in the North for sure. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. Well, um, you know, I kind of shifting gears a little bit. We always try to take a little bit of time towards the end of the podcast to talk about, um, uh, you know, the entertainment uh, scenario, movies, movies, uh, movies something that TV, I'm, perhaps. I'm, I'm kind of passionate. Hockey, well, hockey with the, Canada, win- Canada winning the juniors on the weekend. Yeah. Or well, not the week, but yeah, it was weekend. You know, nope. TV and movies. I, I, I remember uh, looking at last podcast talking about the upcoming Golden Globes. Now they've happened. As predicted, the whole, you know, hashtag me too thing figured prominently with, Everybody, all the all all the attendees wearing black and in, except for in one honor. supposedly. I think yeah, I think there were three. And were there three that three weren't that wearing black? Weren't wearing yeah. black because they felt they were showing their independence. Oh, which is fine. Yes, that's, absolutely. That's, I, I get it. Um, <clears throat> and of course, you know, um, it, it was interesting because uh, best dramatic uh, motion picture was won by one of my favorite movies that I've seen uh, through this period was Three Billboards in uh, in Ebbing, Missouri. So, what is that movie all about, Al? <laughs> it's about it's about three Spoiler billboards in alert. it's it's about three billboards in Ebbing, Missouri, uh, that the, and without uh, without giving away any spoilers that a that a lady um, it, you know acted by Frances McDormand uh, puts up uh, basically to raise awareness around her own uh, daughter who was uh, murdered brutally uh, you know months or maybe a year earlier and felt that not enough attention was being paid to to her daughter's death. And um, a phenomenal screenplay, great cinematography, good editing, all the ingredients. Frances McDormand herself is incredible. And, and it won uh, the best dramatic uh, motion picture. I think the best comedy was uh, Lady Bird. And then I was looking at how often does that correlate to the Oscar winners? And apparently best picture, it can be up to sort of 90% really? uh, prediction. Mm-hmm. Best actor uh, is not as uh, robust a, a prediction because... It's more artsy. because well, it's because of the split. The way they split, it, they'll do the best actor in a comedy, best actor in a drama. They'll do, uh, but so it's interesting. It's not always the best indicator uh, of of what's to come in the Oscars. But if you can take in that three billboards, I, I would do that. Well, I saw a great movie on the weekend with the kids. Yeah, you, it was awesome. It was called the Emoji Movie. 
Really? Wow. No, I'm, that's it was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> it was. Well, well, I, I I couldn't believe the kids sat through that. It was garbage. Really? Yeah. Uh, sorry. Okay. Sorry. So, yeah. uh, obviously, won't be winning any Oscars. No, no, it, I didn't see that one nominated. <laughs> no, don't. But you mentioned Coco, and actually, it Coco. won the Golden Globe. Oh well. It, 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 again, it was a. Gr- it's a great Pixar film. Tearjerker. Almost kids, all. Almost all Pixar films are great shows. So. Yeah, well, they've got some great writers yeah. behind, uh, and uh, the animation. I think I mentioned last time. It's. I don't want to say it gets disconcerting now because they have. You can see their eyelashes and the. I don't want to say the pores. What come? What 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 the hairs come out of? Oh man! Yeah, I was like, uh, that's Ooh. that's good. Uh, that's good. The animation. kids enjoyed it, and yeah. I, I said that last time. The kids enjoyed the Emoji movie, but that was just plain. Have you taken a movie in lately, John? Um, I took in Star Wars, which uh, the Last Jedi. I, the, yeah, the Star Wars: The Last Jedi, which I I thought was really good. But I'm you know remember I I'm old enough to remember going to the show in '77 and yeah. watching the original. Exactly. So yeah. um, so it was nice to see. I, no spoilers, but it was n- just it, it was just nice to sit there and take it in, as yeah. opposed to think about it. And I, I quite enjoyed it. and I'm looking forward to the next one. My mm. my 15 year old son's quite a movie critic, and and it's funny because we were watching talking about Star Wars. We we're watching the Golden Globes, and they kept on showing Laura Dern, who was nominated right. for. Some, every time uh, they would show Laura Dern at the Golden Globes, my 15 year old son would say, "There's the lady that ruins Star Wars." <laughs> <laughs> He was sort of talking, you know, you know, without spoiler. I, I thought you were going to say, there's a lady who put her hand in the dung in Jurassic Park. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that happened too, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah, and then, of course, the big thing that everybody's talking about at the uh, at the Golden Globes was Oprah's uh, speech, which I thought was quite compelling, actually. It was, uh, you know. For, I, I heard my wife listening to it. I was uh, I was on the couch not feeling very well. Okay. Yeah. So what was uh, I guess what was the gist well it was of it? it was the gist of it was just uh, addressing the whole this whole Me Too thing the whole sexual harassment piece and the role of women and and uh, you know you know dealing with that sort of I guess this cultural problem we have where certain men who are in positions of power uh, take advantage of that in in a very negative way and and um, and so you know it was sort of this speech sort of uh, empowering women and I felt. I felt it was quite good, and I think I think it, uh, you know, it was it was good enough that people are starting to whisper, you know, and, and talk pretty openly about Oprah making a run for the presidency in 2020, mm. which would be interesting. <laughs> back uh, to back TV celebrities. Yeah, I mean, it wouldn't uh, it wouldn't completely surprise me probably, but uh, it's, it's I, interesting. I think I've been in actually some movies. President Oprah, <laughs> I would have to say. Anyway. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> I, I, I think it's going to be interesting to see what she actually does. Here's a billionaire who's uh, <laughs> late in her career. Does she really want to take on the presidency? Uh, it'll be interesting. I mean, I think I think she could easily win the nomination by the Democratic Party. Um, it'll be interesting. Yeah. Well, she's a she. Of course, she's a wonderful speaker, uh, incredibly charismatic, uh, brilliant lady, and and uh, and I, I you know. Regardless of your political leanings, as we talked about last time, this whole thing of, of, of changing the culture of sexual harassment, I'm all for that. Right. I, I think that's I think it's good stuff. Would you think that uh, it would be a return to conservative values that may be a solution? And what I mean is very structured social interaction. I don't think so. You know I, I, like, I, I, think I was I'd, thinking about mm, that. It was, you know, like it's very, to, to me, a lot of this comes out, may, may come out of a, a, a loss of, I don't want to, I don't want to say loss, a changing of social structure that would allow that to happen. Whereas if we went back to a situation where it was everything's formalized, you must sit here, I you think do it's, this, you do that, you have a chaperone. I think the problem is in the words conservative values. I think <laughs> that that means, that means different things to different people, yeah, right? right? And I mean, you talk about social conservatism. I don't, I don't know that, I don't know, I don't know. But you talk about, when you talk about a culture of mutual respect, uh, you know, again, I'm. I don't know if that's, if that's depending on your leaning or what you think conservative values mean. I I don't know that we're all on the same page there. Right? Yeah, I think conservative values to some people would be what the problem was. Right. That 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 this power structure with males in charge yeah, and males, this kind oh, of. Oh uh, yeah, I guess if you put yeah. it, if if you look at it that way, that. Well, I'm more of thinking, you know, say watching. I don't know. I pick, pick a uh, Downton Abbey where everybody is like, oh, that is improper for you to be in the same room as him at the same time. Right. You know, c- 
would that maybe where we would return to? Yeah, the problem is that back in the days of Downton Abbey, you know, women were still struggling to vote and, you right. know, participate properly. Right. So I, I'm not for that. Like I'm, when it comes to social conservatives, uh, social conservatism, I, I would say I'm not there. Yeah, I'm, well, I'm a more open guy. I'm a more progressive guy when it comes to social things. But when you talk about fiscal and regulatory, I'm very much like right. get yeah. the government out of our hair and let's yeah. let's let's live our and if you go lives. to a social you know conservative values and you look at Vice President Mike Pence you know one of the one oh. of his views is I'm never in a, lo- a room alone with a woman without an, another person there and I would never go out for dinner with a woman without my wife being there mm. so yeah. that's I, I, and what's but, I don't but you know when, when I, I don't either when you're the vice president you got to be incredibly careful right. Uh, you know, because because one of the things that happens, of course, in these in these different roles of president, manager. You know, you've been a manager. Mm-hmm. I'm the president of the company. I, I look after right now, and and often you don't realize. Well, you're still you. You're right. still who you are. And and but sometimes I've I've realized there's been moments where I've realized people don't see you. They see you as the boss or that guy that makes the decisions or has mm-hmm. the power. Uh, you know, it's sometimes you have to remind yourself. Wait a minute. Uh, you know, we're we're maybe not quite on an equal footing here, right. and we've got to respect that and and uh, and and be conscious of that. Right. right? Yeah. I don't, I don't know how to say that any better, but that's kind of where I would go. Right. So right. I, I get it when the VP says, you know, I'm going to be very careful. Uh, right. Yeah, sure. Yeah. You know. well, why not? That's, yeah. And that's why I said, for me, that's a conservative value. It's like, oh. Oh no! This isn't proper. I, Drink, yeah, I'm not sure like that this. is. I, I'm not sure that's what conservative. I don't traditional. Yeah. How about what if I said traditional? The same. No. Uh, formal, same. How, about, how about formalized? <laughs> I know you, Chris. You're not a conservative value. <laughs> no, I'm guy. not. But I, when I think about this, it's like it, it, maybe it makes sense. Maybe the ancients, or no, I don't want to say ancients. The ancients. <laughs> oh my god! Sometime in the past, there was like these. Like you, you sit like this. You you, you open a conversation like this. You're talking about <laughs> what, what I think we're talking about is just respectful interaction. There we right? go. Maybe Appropriate that's interaction, yes. right? That's what you're talking respectful, about. Respectful, formalized, formalized interaction. interaction. I think you're right. I think that'll come. I think that'll come. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, cool. Okay. All right. Uh, so I guess uh, is is that it for today? Have we got anything else? Anything else? No, on this was great. Thank you for letting me be your first guest. Yeah. Hopefully well, a lot more, and have you back in the uh, future. Sure. Yeah, that'd be great. Well, there's I feel like there's so much more to talk about, right? And and uh you know, we'll see what happens here with the opening of Anwar, or the the Alaska National Alaska National Wildlife Refuge and so yep. forth. That'd be interesting stuff. All right. Uh okay. we'll take take us out. I will. Is this a new one? Same one. Oh. It's the end of it. <laughs> this end is of my it. song and my only song on iTunes. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, thanks for joining us. I'm Dr. Chris. I'm Alan Chatney, and our guest today has been John Hogue. Thanks, thanks, John. Thanks again. And that was Source Points number two. Three. Number three. That was number three. Number three. All right. <laughs> thanks. Thanks.